of sound painting, the way in which it's used, but what we haven't spoke about is the audience very much. So what type of people or art enthusiasts come to sound painting? Um, I think I, my experience is that anybody, uh, any and everybody enjoys, uh, I mean this is a pretty broad statement so I don't mean to be so uh, flippant. flippant, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but. I'm going to tell you a quick story. When I first brought sound painting to Europe, it was through Ed Sarath and Dave Liebman who invited me to a, give a conference and uh, be part of a conference and give a demonstration of sound painting in Santiago de Compostela in Spain. This is at the end of the 90s. And then afterwards, I went to Barcelona and uh, uh, I was part of the Lim Festival and um, the, uh, they had organized a, a group for me. Mm -hmm. And so this was the first time I was going to present sound painting in Spain. And so I was in rehearsal that afternoon, just one afternoon of rehearsal, only you know, have a chance to teach some about 40, 45 signs, enough to make a, a good piece. And, uh, um, and I was doing this at a church, in the courtyard of a church in Barcelona. And then I went out to get something to eat after rehearsal, and I came back, and I noticed a lot of elderly people, you know, sort of the blue hair crowd, if you will, um, I like the blue hair thing. And, and so there was nothing but elderly people, you know, and I thought they were going to like a Sunday evening mass, you know. Uh, and so I went to, to, to the courtyard where the orchestra was set up and, and getting ready to start the performance. So I walked out to start and the public was there and the public was all of these elderly people. And I thought they're going to kill me. You know, I'm going to be hung by the toes, you know, in the town square. And um, but so I did, you know, and I, I think the best art comes from honesty. And so I was honest in, you know, in my approach to the sound painting. I didn't feel like the people were inhibiting me in any such way. And I, and I did my work. And even in the end, I scanned the public and, and whatnot, and I got, got a great response from them. You know, so I was, so what is, who does the sound painting appeal to? I think, it, it, I say everybody because I, I don't think the audience necessarily has to have like an education, uh, uh, you know, to understand contemporary music, uh, uh, like back in the 50s and 60s and first coming to hear Stockhausen, maybe it turned a lot of people off who had never heard anything like the, that. And they, maybe themselves, they thought, oh, I need to um, go get an education in contemporary art. So I don't think that's again, true. It's inclusive. I mean, part of the reason for me asking the question um, extends to all the sound painters like ourselves who say, how do you advertise your ensemble or your performance in terms of getting audience? Do you need to say sound painting the title? Of course, no, you don't. A lot of ensembles do say they are a sound painting ensemble and give a name to it, but essentially you don't need to do that if the word doesn't mean anything to the potential audience. Yeah, how do you advertise? I mean, is that that's the question? Yeah. I mean, I think today, I mean, I, I often use the word sound painting in somewhere in the, in the publicity. I, I, I mean, the, the people that are organizing the performances for me we use sound painting in there, and of course, a, a CV or a bio or something about, you know, a, a description of sound painting and whatnot, for those that don't know it. But uh, right now, I, we're, we're, most groups are including the word sound painting in, yeah. in their, you know, advertisement of, of the performance. Mm -hmm. I think uh, 50 years from now, that will be necessary. I mean, sound painting is a tool, it's not a style. Exactly. But yeah. I think it's, right now, it's important in a way to say that that's how it's going to be. I mean, it's like John Zorn's Cobra. John's, but the name of the piece is Cobra, and it's actually a specific, you know, set of rules. And, and um, but still, the results are, are always different, and Cobra is a, sign, a wonderful signing uh, system. Mm -hmm. It's uh, you know, but but John advertises as Cobra. So I mean, sound painting is not a piece; it's a it's a tool. But to get the audience to kind of understand what they're coming to and what they're going to see, a lot of people use sound painting to explain, you know, that this is the tool that's going to you know produce the composition. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's something exciting about that yeah. that you know you're going to go and see somebody compose in real time.
well, so there are quite a few of um, the stone painters, myself included, um, are working in countries where we apply for funding for research and we have to justify what we do. And one of those things that we often have to justify is the cultural value of arts, and in this case particularly sound painting. So what is the cultural value of sound painting as a creative language? Well, I think when you ask me that question, I think the first thing I would say is that anybody can be a part of a sound painting group. Mm -hmm. so, so when it comes to education, speaking of education, uh, you know, we don't need to have music instruments, or we don't need to have a black box theater, or we don't need to have a dance room. Uh, uh, creativity or, or, or forms in, uh, in the performing arts like music and dance and theater can be taught uh, on a very low budget. <laughs> a very low budget with sound painting. I mean, in today's, you know, days of austerity, we need, you know, the, anyway, so we could use something like that. You've still got two issues in there because you've, you've instantly gone to education, so you're saying it has, uh, it's open to diversity, regardless of background, demography, economic income, whatever. Exactly. It, you can be open to it from wherever somebody is from. That's it's absolutely breaking down all the boundaries. And at the same time, you can train this with absolutely no extra facilities. But on the other hand, if you have the instruments, you've got a professional orchestra, you can still do something with that group as well and generate something from them. So, absolutely, part, yes. so part of this cultural value, of course, is your aspiration to retain quality, as you said, within the accreditation process. Mm -hmm. And in really checking that people know how to use the language and use it in such a way that they're proficient and fluent because you clearly aspire for a quality musical dance theatre performance. Right, yes. Um, we've spoken a little bit about personal styles and that this has worked out in a number of different cultures as a, a thriving base of sound painting in France and in Spain. It, there's a the growth of it in England and of course within Sweden. How do people bring their own identity, their own sort of personal value to, to sound painting? Well one is I don't think they have a choice, you know. I mean I think that you know, first they have to get past the you know the point that they're fluent with the language, that they're fluid with the movement, you know. And at that point they they just speaking about their body and how it's commu communicating you know the ideas to the group you'll see with different sound painters the signing kind of becomes more personal you know um, how they give the play gesture how they give an off gesture how they phrase i mean sometimes i watch uh, so eventually their personality comes into that person you know they become a part of the language the language becomes a part of them and i've i've learned so much from from people that have only been sound painting one or two years and sometimes they'll make up a phrase that's obviously something that really is attractive to them that wasn't necessarily attractive to me that I had never thought of. Mm -hmm. And that I learn from, I go, oh, well, okay, there's something interesting I have not. Yeah. It's been right there in front of my face if I want to try to go in and yeah. Yeah. explore and put things together and see what I can come out with, with, with a phrase. It's been right there in front of my fa uh, face, but I've never thought about doing it. Here's a person that's done that. And it's just using basic language or maybe some second level language. And I'm surprised to go, oh, wow, because, you know. So the personal voice can always be projected. I mean, more than that, as you said earlier in the discussion, um, in the use of palettes, you can integrate folk music, the oral tradition, you can bring in and, and cite and quote phrases of literature, you can use um, installations and, and settings. So if you wanted to do a culturally specific performance, I, my understanding is that you can insert sound painting into that. So in what ways is sound painting perhaps used hip-hop or bebop or a classical tradition or sound painted maybe a genre like a passion play for example? Mm -hmm. In what ways is it used? Yeah. I mean, we, we know, it, it, it's, it's the tool to put that piece together. I mean, simply put. I mean, I've done, um, I took Haydn's, Haydn Concerto and C for Cello and Chamber Orchestra and I, and, I, and I made a sound painting out of it. With Gail Seliger and I worked together on this with a, with a pickup a freelance orchestra in New York City. And um, I mean, it, it's, it's not the Haydn Concerto, you know, but it's the Haydn Concerto uh, put back together by sound painting in a much different way. So it's not Haydn's work anymore, it's my work influenced by Haydn's work and the use of some of Haydn's notation. 
To become a response to, to be, this. And a, a to become like a response to that, because I like the piece and sort of my interpretation of the piece. Mm -hmm. So yes, you can take in. So you're in some, you know, in, in, in a culture where you want to take in, like I'm hoping to do a um, uh, sound painting workshop and performance in India in 2015. I haven't been there yet to teach and, and, to, and, to, and to compose a work there. But it looks like that's what's going to happen, and that's going to be very fascinating for me that the that the musicians are going to be playing different instruments than say the you know that I would, might find here in in France or Sweden or wherever in the United States. There'll be a different set of instruments, uh, and I think that's that's you know fascinating for both the composer and and the group. And here's a here's a language that that it's the same language I'm using in in with groups and. In, uh, in France or in, in New York or wherever, but now I'm applying this language to uh, another culture. So because it's a tool, it's like you've got a toolbox, you can pull these signs out, you can create a quality performance that breaks down boundaries, that integrates everybody, it's inclusive, inclusive of all levels, all ability, it can foster social mobility in many ways, it's accessible for those that are visually or orally impaired, there's ways to deal with that as well. Um, or physically impaired, um, and it transgresses the cultural boundaries, but at the same time doesn't ignore those. It allows you to use cultural specifics should you wish to. It allows Absolutely. you to um, consider how homage to previous composers or artists, while at the same time pushing forwards to create something new, which is the essence of creativity, constantly pushing forward what we're able to create. And to right, it, it, it's why I keep, you know, it's, it's some people have... Um, and sound painting is very young, it's not even 50 years old. And so it's a very young language and, and some people will, will, who don't understand it, critics of sound painting will say that you know, it's kind of like a, a style or something. It, what, what you just said, it can do all of those things because it's not a style, it's a tool. We can use a hammer in, a, in multiple situations, you know, and this is a tool in a sense. Including you know, in sound painting. Yeah. In tool, including <laughs> in sound painting. <laughs> <laughs> so it might be worth just thinking about where sound painting has gone to to emphasise its cultural value because if it was a style it might not move us as freely across borders and across across uh, sort of de demo demographics. But it exists obviously we've said United States, United Kingdom, Ireland, it's like forty five countries or something. Like exactly. So where been... sort of where's it most newly integrated, shall we say? Or there might be a, a single sound painter or a couple of sound painters really grabbing onto the yeah, I mean, it's newly integrated in, like in, in China and in Tanzania and in countries in, in Africa yeah. and, and, and also in countries in South America like Chile and Uruguay and Venezuela. It's, it's now growing more in those countries. Yeah. And uh, in, um, in I Iran, uh, also in Iran, which I'm very happy for. And, and, uh, I mean, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, those countries have been having sound painting for seven or eight years now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Which is wonderful. So we're really getting across all those political boundaries that other things might not necessarily infiltrate. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Walter. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
I thought, this is ridiculous. I don't own it. It's a language. I happen to be the one that created it. And, but it's not going to be a language if I'm the only one speaking it. You know? So I want to share this with whoever is interested in using it, and I hope many are, mm -hmm. as it's turned out lots of people are using it. But at the time, I wanted to share it with whoever wanted to use it, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to you know, put any roadblocks up for people, you know, like, uh, uh, here's a restriction, yeah. like this is trademark. So right away, people think, oh, we need to ask Walter if, if, yeah. if we can use sound painting. Yeah. The language wouldn't grow, so I removed the trademark. Yeah. yeah. So it's not for anyone to use, but obviously then there's still a lot of primary source uh, material of your own with the workbooks. There's three out, four and five in process. You've got the dictionary, you've got the glossary. You've also got the commercial release performances, the open source performances, and a number of interviews, interviews of you on the radios and things in uh, different festivals. There's plenty of material there. Mm. Good. <laughs> Let's talk about your expectations and the future of sound painting for a moment. You've been working this language for quite some time now. Um, what are your expectations for a group that has a long-standing experience, so like the Walsh Thompson Orchestra? When you sign whole group minimalism, go or beat in, you've got an idea of what that group's going to give you. So could you tell me something about the familiarity that you have with your group and how that affects your use of the language? Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's, uh, there's something, you know, it's one thing to go in and work a few, have a few rehearsals with a, a new set of people and, uh, and then do a concert, you know. That's ex extremely exciting to constantly change the instrument, so to speak. The group is the instrument for the sound painter, right? And then it's another thing to, to have a group and, and to, to know the people and to sort of, to be a family in a way where, you know, this creative family that, that we're challenging each other all the time, certainly. But there's many times where we can say to each other, oh, I, oh yes, you did that again. You know, and, and they do that with me too, like, you know, Gil Selinger will say, oh, I knew where Walter was going to go with that. And I'm sure, sure the rest of the performers feel the same way and sometimes I feel like I know where they're going to go. So that, so, but at the same time there's a comfort level, uh, they're very fluent with the language. So, uh, so they're much quicker to respond, I would think, with point to point as soon as you, me, you oh, yeah, oh, sure. or, or hits the very quick. But I'm also thinking um, that once you know... But you also, know, but just to say that yeah. there's something about that that's really important, they're very quick to respond, but the reason they are is because they're so comfortable with the language, and this is one of, one of the things some other students of mine have pointed out to me that have seen my group and seen me sound paint with my group, is they said they don't seem to even really be watching you, kind of. They don't seem to be like staring intently at you like a lot of younger groups, younger in the language, knowledge of the language, where they will just, what's next, and, oh, what does that mean, and kind of, you know, translating each gesture to, oh, yes, oh, okay. You know, but, with my group and other, you know, other groups that have been around a long time, like Spoon, you know, and the Swedish Sound Painting Orchestra and Zaha, and different groups that have been around for for a long time, they, it's the the phrases, the the phrase whether it be simple or complex is so readily understood that the performer can offer numerous choices, that, so they don't feel inhibited by the, you know, the the. Uh, the, the fluidity yeah. or the fluency that they have, you know, yeah. they are totally fluent. In. So for the performer, this is fluency. For the um, sound painter, the composer, I'm thinking if you're aware of how somebody might respond, it might change your gestures. Because we both know people from the last think tank that when you sign something, you've got an idea of where they're going to go. So you almost modify what you might sign or what you might not in terms of over the top or complexity. You know that that's going to mean something different for each person and you modify it accordingly in a sense. Mm. Do you find that a restriction? Do you find that something exciting, an opportunity? Well, I, I mean, I, yeah, I understand what you're saying and I try to, I mean, even though I know my players, just speaking of my group because that would be a, a, a yeah, yeah. good group to answer this question with. Even though I might know where Rolf Sturm is going to go a little bit, I don't really. Yeah. Even though I know where Lise Walker is going to go, I don't really. Because she might give me 
one fiftieth. I mean, I recognize one fiftieth of what she's doing. So that's the familiar part. There it is again, kind of. But the rest of the time, uh, these are these are sound painting performers that have that are fully fluent in the language and know to give something different and challenge me. They're gonna. They're basically going after giving me something like you know. I've opened up a door for them, I've given them a gesture that has these parameters, and they can fill that, that gesture hundreds of different ways. So I never, I really, I honestly sort of never know, uh, most of the time, where they're going to go. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, what Duke Ellington said, you know, he, he would compose for his orchestra because he knew kind of like what the people could do, mm -hmm. you know, and in some sense I have that. So you're constantly expanding what they're able to do, you know that they're professionals. And they're the constantly the expanding, like let me, let me give this to Walter, and so they, they're, they're, they're constantly changing and growing and evolving artists, all of them, and, and they, they will, uh, they're, they're f incredibly fine sound painting performers, so they are going to just, you know, something comes up in their life that they find interesting and it finds its way through through their discipline and out to me. So there's always something new coming from them. I, I really never get bored. So it's a good message to other life composers that are newer in their craft, shall we say, that continue to be challenged by what you might expect and don't assume that you're going to get the same thing or always take it further. Yeah, and, and, and if you do with your group, if you are receiving a lot of the same material, then you need to go back in rehearsal and tell them, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> Do point to point with change and really work the group until they give you, you know, to, to they really offering new ideas all the time, and that's the challenge yeah. for the sound painting performer. I think the challenge is, as you said, the new ideas because we spoke before that musicians can, with new groups, offer complementary um, or similar material, whereas actors, dancers are quite more able and more familiar with offering contrast. So perhaps to avoid this sense of Mickey Mousing um, or one thing parallelism another, to really use change and to constantly fire that at a group to get something that isn't similar. Yeah, it, constantly, constantly. I mean, that's the way I, re I rehearse a group before a performance. And just to take one tiny little step back to, you know, working with children and whatnot, I was, um, you know, uh, doing like an improvisation with my daughter who has just now turned four, Kaylee's just turned four, and maybe five or six months ago, we were just making sounds back and forth to each other, and she really knew that we were improvising. No doubt, it was another word in that sense. She never repeated herself. I, I think I would repeat myself before she did. And this goes back to that, that what I was saying about children are naturally uh, creative. They're naturally able to be flexible, yeah. yeah. She did not ever repeat herself for 15 minutes. And that, that not one repetition, and every, not one. <laughs> Keeping on your toes. Kept me on my toes, yes. <laughs> of our discussion, let's consider issues of performance practice and the way in which sound painting is being used. We've said there are many ways of using sound painting, that each sound painter might have their own style or a group might have a particular uh, focus or an agenda that they're using, um, that you can impose or leave things as open as possible. But we've, you've sort of established there are two schools, so my question is going to be really broad, but can you identify what these sort of two schools of thought are? how they're identified, and what your opinion is on that. Yeah, I mean, it's my own sort of way of looking at the growth of sound painting, and I, uh, you know, sort of, you know, on, I created the two schools, and, you know, to just uh, sort of, in, in a way to say that, you know, that the language is growing, and it's not only growing one way, it's being used many different ways, but there's a basic sort of two schools of thought. It's what I call the technics mm -hmm. and the chancers, and it, it, one is not better than the other. I don't mean anything as such. Um, a technic is somebody who is very interested in complex phrases, and before they even go to rehearsal, they have a command of the language, and before they go to rehearsal, they might like fill out different complex phrases and, and go to the rehearsal and, and do more imposing of their phrases you know, I like this, I'm going to rehearse this, and this have 10, 15, 20 different phrases. This isn't necessarily how a technique always works, but 
But in their mind, they're, they're thinking in a much more complex way. Their phrases are much aspiring more complex. Aspiring for complexity. They're aspiring for imposing. complexity or aspiring for even, maybe not even just complexity, but detail. Like, how do I get this to happen? How do I get that to happen? How do I get this to happen? And it's that question they're asking themselves. How do I get that to happen? How do I get that to happen? That question that, that you're putting to yourself when you're sitting there wondering about your sound painting composition, the fact that you're putting that question to yourself makes you a technic. Because, uh, and so, so that's what the technic does. The technic goes and they impose their idea, you know. Yeah. Often there's a lot more imposition of idea. And the, the chancers, so-called, the chancer group of sound painters, of course, everybody's a mix of both, and some people more than others. <laughs> so I'm a mix of both, of course. But, uh, uh, but I rarely sit back and say, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? Uh, as a chancer, the, the chancer makes the first sign and then doesn't think how they're going to do the next thing, but just does it yeah. because both can have a great knowledge of the language. There's a difference between theory and application. One person can do and learn from doing and then reflect on it, analyze and, and learn each time they do. Someone else can learn by writing down the phrase, thinking about it, then imposing it, whether it's practice-led, practice-based, what have you. Um, and, it's, and it's for them, for the person that, that writes it down ahead of time, it's, that's their desire to use the language in that manner. I mean, it's, in a way, it's, it's, it's closer to traditional con, uh, composing. Yeah. When you're doing that, it's much closer. But there's, I mean, the language is open to be used however you want. You know, the way we put, you know, use the English language to just put one word on the sign and the sign is stop. I mean, that's not the entire English language, but it works wonderfully for just stop. You know, so, you know, so the, you know, so people want to use sound painting in a little bit of a way that kind of blends traditional mm -hmm. composing, you know, uh, ideas with, with live composing ideas, that's fine. And those people I call techniques, and I think that fork in the development of sound painting is just as important as the other fork. Yeah, but the majority yeah. obviously move between. I think what, what you're clearly, clearly iterating by talking about these two schools is different ways of developing your own style. And as a live composer thinking, what is it I do and why do I do what I do? Because one thing we've not said yet in this discussion is you've got four sections in your syntax, but actually it's the fifth section of why does the sound, point, sound painter do what they do, and that why falls very much into the ways in which you're thinking in life. Right, to, right to be clear, well, the sound painter, the syntax for the sound painter, right? Mm -hmm. Who, what, how, when, why? And there's no why gesture, but it's, 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 it's here, you know, this is part of it. You know, when all of that is done, the syntax has been, you know, signed, the why has to come into yeah. Why did you do that? And I think that's part of the assessment we were speaking about before. And uh, It's the assessment if you're trying to check that somebody can teach or learn, has learned sound painting, but I think it's also your personal reflection. I mean, I mentioned your very traditional educational model that you impose some you reflect and you change it, you do it again. But part of yourself in thinking backwards and forwards, you've got to think, how am I going to use it? Why am I doing this? How am I going to bring it back? The why and the how are constantly... Yeah working in tandem, aren't they? Uh, absolutely. The why is always there. It's always there. Because as much as we're talking about chances or techniques, no one's a complete chance because we're not constantly saying, whole group improvise, off you go, I'm leaving you. No. And we're not also saying, there's my score with all my gestures written down. So it's just a way in which to think about where you're situating yourself at each moment in a piece. Right. Yeah. Right, exactly. In a very positive way rather than right. the negative. Exactly. Yeah. Walter, well, so would you like to end with the uh, a passionate plea to the sound painters and aspiring <laughs> sound painters out there. Yeah, I guess if I could wrap it up in, in one simple sentence, I would like to say to anybody pursuing sound painting, uh, as a composer in, in this case, um, and a performer, uh, simply say that to, to work with the known and the unknown and to make art out of it. Thank you. Welcome. Mm -hmm.